Welcome to Stars and Swords, I'm Alistair Stevens. This week, something unexpected and something brief. It is spring break here in the United States, and I'm afraid that my schedule has been all but consumed by the demands of the changing season. And since I know that many of you are all in the same spot, I thought it might be a good idea to put out a much shorter introductory episode of this podcast, then get to our first reading of Catherine Kerr's excellent Celtic fantasy dagger spell next week on March 24th. The first thing I want to do in this shorter episode is to map out a little bit of the landscape of fantasy fiction in both 1982, when Kerr begins writing the story that will become this novel, and in 1986, when it is first published. It is, perhaps, an oversimplification to suggest that 20th century fantasy faces three transformative moments which just so happen to coincide with the publication of The Hobbit in 1937, The Lord of the Rings beginning in 1954, and the posthumous publication of Professor Tolkien's The Silmarillion in 1977. But if that is an oversimplification, it certainly isn't much of one. Certainly, there are people who jump the tracks, who anticipate the movement of the industry as a whole, or who resolutely do their own thing throughout the century, but the movement in scale, in ambition, and in comprehensivity can at least be pretty consistently tracked through the work of Professor Tolkien. The Lord of the Rings takes a lot of the air out of the room when it is published, and it limits the number of truly influential fantasy novels which are published immediately thereafter. Apart from Michael Moorcock's Elric books and the works of Ursula Le Guin and Anne McCaffrey, there are few very influential fantasy novels between 1954 and 1974, which marks the publication of the first edition of Dungeons and Dragons, from which you can directly draw a line to lots and lots of 80s fantasy. In 1977, the year The Silmarillion is published, we get three other distinctive fantasy novels, each one of which is emblematic of a part of the fantasy industry. We get The Sword of Shannara by Terry Brooks, which is the most blatant retelling of The Lord of the Rings you're ever likely to read. We get Lord Fowl's Bane, the first of the Chronicles of Thomas Covenant by Stephen Donaldson, which marries some of the scale of Tolkien with a low-magic portal fantasy approach, heavy on the sexual assault. And we get A Spell for Chameleon, the first of Piers Anthony's Xanth novels, parodies of mass market fantasy fiction given new accessibility and internal variety and internal specificity thanks to Dungeons and Dragons. To be clear, none of those books are good, but they are all interesting. They all lead at least to interesting things. Both Shannara and Thomas Covenant become much more interesting as their series progress. And, well, as for Xanth, I read those books when I was 13, and I thought that they were hilarious. How far we've come. Stephen King publishes The Stand in 1978. His vision of an American The Lord of the Rings, at least that is how he conceptualizes it. Michael Anda writes The Neverending Story in 1979. Gene Wolfe writes the first of the books of The New Sun, The Shadow of the Torturer, in 1980, vastly expanding what fantasy stories can be and do. Then, in 1982, we have a confluence. Raymond E. Feist publishes Magician, the first book of the Rift War saga. David Eddings publishes Pawn of Prophecy, the first book of the Belgariad. And Stephen King publishes The Gunslinger, the first of the Dark Tower series. And that's the world as it stands when Kerr begins writing. Giant books, giant series, giant ideas, anchored in a cast of thousands, and much more importantly, anchored in a programmatic, systemic approach to characterization that is absolutely one of the influences of Dungeons & Dragons. And this is an incomplete history, obviously, but if we're going to pick up one of the broadest of brushes, then we ought at least to paint with it. All of this continues through the 1980s, perhaps finding its culmination in the 1990 publication of The Eye of the World, the first of Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time books. From there into the 90s, We'll see some interesting work on the fringes, and then, of course, we get the swing into low fantasy storytelling led in the charge by George R.R. Martin. So this is the world that Kerr is stepping into in 82. Very post-Tolkien, very big ideas, world building that is deep in the sense that it is systemized, but not perhaps in the sense that it is unique or consistent or well-developed. Moreover, Kerr rejects the default fantasy setting of a Middle Ages, Ren Fair, Knights and Fair Maidens world, choosing instead to pursue something that starts out far more specific and unique and grows only more so. In fact, 
We can connect that setting to my second purpose in this short introduction, because I also wanted to offer a note on pronunciation. I know that some readers over in the Stars and Swords Discord had some questions, and because for all that the pronunciation guide in the beginning of the book lays out the rules, they can be a little difficult to parse. I will note here that the Ruth Urquhart audiobook production does a really good job, particularly with the Welsh accents for dialogue, which I won't even attempt, so that's recommended. Though I'll say I think she handles Jill far better than the host of male characters she has to contend with. As I said, Daggerspell is a Celtic fantasy, and the high-level concept underpinning this work is, well, let's hear it from the book itself. This is from near the beginning of chapter one. Quote, the folks of Devery have always been the restless sort. In the old days of the dawn time, the ancestors wandered thousands of miles before they settled the old kingdom, Devitia Riga, which was part of a faraway land called Gallia. The bards still tell many a tale how the ancestors fled the encroaching Romanes and sailed across a vast ocean under the leadership of King Bran to find the Western Isles. They rode all over the Isles, too, before King Bran saw the omen of the white sow that told him where to found the holy city of Dundevery. End quote. Gallia there is Gaul, what we might think of as modern-day France. The Vitia Riga, Riga here is a suffix that suggests royal, so royal de Vitia is a kingdom in Gaul. Under the leadership of King Bran, no Game of Thrones reference here, or actually there is a Game of Thrones reference, and it's the same Game of Thrones reference because Bran is raven in the Celtic languages. Under the leadership of King Bran, the people of Divitia Riga flee from the encroaching Romanes, the Romans, and discover this new place, the Western Isles, which becomes, after King Bran sees the omen of the White Sow, the new kingdom of Devery. So the high-level idea, what is happening here is that a Celtic tribe flees the Roman conquest of Gaul and sets up shop in a land of fairies, elves, old gods, and magic. They come from our world and move into that other world. That happened a thousand years ago in their timeline, as of the beginning of the book, so a lot has changed since then, and the language and customs have evolved over time, but that's the Celtic heart of the piece. Interestingly, the White Sow Omen, which leads King Bran to found the new capital city in Devery, is a myth found in books of ancient Rome, which perhaps suggests that the Gallic tribe which departed for Devery were more influenced by Roman culture than is otherwise suggested, more Romanicized? This origin story means that Daggerspell doesn't feel like most other fantasy novels. It's infused with ancientry, with Celtic myth and custom, and most importantly, with language, which takes us back to that matter of pronunciation. In general, I do think that Ruth Urquhart does a very good job. One thing that Urquhart misses, though, and which I think is generally overlooked, is the note on diphthongs, all of which have a consistent pronunciation. E-O is pronounced between E and A, so it's a uh, it's something like uh, which tells us that the magic system in this world is pronounced Dwemer rather than Dweomer. The other big thing that will trip people up, well, there are two common characteristics of Celtic languages, I guess. The double D giving the voiced TH sound, so the southwestern province on the map, for example, is called Eldith, and includes the town of Abernauth, Abernauth, the AU diphthong there giving us an ow, as in how, Abernauth. Also, we have the W vowel, the U sound, found in Anun, which in actual real-life Welsh, means the other world, the land of fairies, but here is translated as no place, the name of the world in which this series takes place, right? That's Anun, or Cum, which means valley, C-W-M, Cum, or indeed in the Rumanis, the Deverian name for the Romans. These two elements, the vowel W and the double D-T-H sound, are combined beautifully into the word Luth, L-W-D-D, Luth, which means blood price, a sum paid as compensation upon the death of an individual to their family. Though Celtic languages have fairly simple pronunciation rules, there is one grey area in the book. The pronunciation guide says that the accent is usually on the penultimate syllable of the word, but compound words and place names are often excluded. So technically, I suppose, Deveri and Kergoni might be correct, but... I am a creature of habit, so I will slip into Devery and Kurgany, Kermor, Aberwin, Eldeth. Let's quickly also gloss the names that we're going to encounter in the first part of the book. Jill, obviously, is nice and easy. Her father is Cullen of Kermor. 
Mackin, called Mako, is the owner of the tavern where Jill grows up. Cullen gets hired on by Tiran Braith to stand against the men of Lord Inith. Inith, there, Y-N-Y-D-D. And, of course, the mysterious urban Nevin and the charming young noble Lord Rodri Mailwaith. Lord Rodri Melwith. Then in chapter two, the names are pretty straightforward, particularly if we remember that A-E is always consistently pronounced A as in Geraint and Blaine. Oh, and uh, Bran Gwen, which splits into two syllables between the N and the G. Bran Gwen, not the slightly less attractive Bran Gwen. Bran Gwen. We should also mention two weird, W-Y-R-D, an Anglo-Saxon word from the Proto-Germanic, which means you know, fate or personal destiny. In late Middle English, it comes to mean having the power to influence or change that fate, and it's connected with the three witches in Shakespeare's Macbeth, of course, the Weird Sisters. It doesn't take on its current meaning, strange or uncanny, until the 19th century, and it gets that from the association with those witches, from those who can control fate or destiny. It might be helpful, too, just to gloss the outline of the geography of the world, the political geography, at least, that we are going to inhabit in this novel, at least at the highest levels, because Kerr is leaning hard on real-world feudalism here. The country of Devery, at least as we meet it in the first part of the book, is composed of nine provinces, or Gwerbrethen, each ruled by a Gwerbret. These provinces are roughly equivalent to medieval duchies, and the Guerbrets swear fealty only to the High King who resides in Dundevery, in the province of Devery, in the nation of Devery. That is Fort Devery in the, the Duchy of Devery in the Kingdom of Devery. See, it's completely easy and transparent. Each Guerbret is owed allegiance and fealty by a number of Tirans. These are nobles roughly comparable to counts in our real Western European feudal history. Beneath the Tirans are merely lords, noblemen who rule individual holdings, such as castles. When Jill is born, to spoil the first couple of pages of the book, she lives with her mother Serian in the town of Bobir in the province of Kurgany, which is then ruled by Lord Melon, who owes fealty to a local Tyran, who owes fealty to the local Gwerbret, who owes fealty to the High King. In the feudal system, you are responsible to the person above you in the chain, but you are responsible for the people below you. Their well-being, their happiness, their safety is your responsibility, and the difference between a good noble and a bad noble is how that responsibility is handled, and I promise we'll have plenty of opportunity to talk about the mechanics of feudalism as we move through this fascinating book. All of that, then, gives us, I think, a solid foundation for the first reading, which will cover the prologue, chapter 1, Kurgany, 1052, and chapter 2, Devery, 643. As I said last time, we're going to be focusing primarily on the world building, but I do encourage you to get caught up in the story, too. This is one of the most original and vibrant fantasy worlds that I can remember reading, and I'm really excited to talk about it over the course of the next few weeks. That'll do it for this very short introductory episode. I'll be back next week with much more. Until then, enjoy the reading, and thanks for listening.